A key question regarding the new biologic agents for atopic dermatitis is how long do these agents need to be used? If you look at other drugs that are used to treat autoimmune conditions as an indicator, there really are no studies that show whether or not these therapies can be safely discontinued. Certainly in rheumatoid arthritis, there are a couple of different diagnostic or biomarker tests that help inform which patients might be weaned or might be safely weaned, but to date we really don't have answers to the question of how long therapies need to be used, and we're in desperate need of biomarkers or other predictive tools that help us answer that question because these therapies are expensive, and while we can afford to pay for them, uh, the, the larger question is, can patients and, and their families continue these therapies lifelong because of the financial toxicity associated? In terms of prioritizing patients who are eligible for newly approved biologic treatments of atopic dermatitis, we think there are a number of critical issues that have to be addressed. First, have patients failed more conservative treatments in the management of their condition, and that's not only the topical corticosteroids, but other therapies, including non-pharmacologic therapies such as emollients. We know from the published data that adherence with these treatment regimens for atopic dermatitis are challenging because they are oftentimes administered several times a day in small kids over a large body surface area. For therapies, especially that are greasy, it can be challenging. There are newer therapies such as the topical calcineurin inhibitors that can be used that have good efficacy in some patients and don't have systemic absorption. But beyond those topical corticosteroids and topical calcineurin inhibitors, we run into challenges with the systemic therapies because they can cause immune suppression and organ toxicity. So most health plans today are covering drugs such as dupilumab after evidence that the patients have failed more conservative treatments. There is some evidence in clinical practice that physicians are bypassing topical calcineurin inhibitors to move on to biologic therapies after failure of topical corticosteroids. Likewise, they're bypassing oral systemic therapies. As I indicated, given the safety profile of the TCIs, most plans won't allow physicians to bypass TCIs, but I think most are willing to bypass the oral systemic agents, again, because of the toxicities associated. Those drugs include the drugs such as cyclosporine or azathioprine methotrexate. Those drugs include drugs such as lycosporin, azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate. The use of phototherapy is still in question. Today, as a health plan, we don't require the failure of phototherapy, but in many practices, that is an option for patients and their families. As a health plan, when we consider a drug for formula inclusion, one of the key questions is how do we assess adverse events, routes of administration, quality of life, and other issues besides just cost and efficacy? Certainly, every drug can have adverse events. Typically, when we look at adverse events or safety issues, we're simply assessing whether or not the FDA has deemed this drug safe for distribution. Some drugs, none of these, though, have black box warnings we're loath to put a drug with a black box warning ahead of something that doesn't. So for the most part, unless there's a black box warning, safety, tolerability, and adverse events really don't play a role in our formulary inclusion process or in our positioning of drugs on the formulary. With respect to route of administration, I think most plans are indifferent to the route of administration. There are some drugs that might be administered IV, none of these for atopic dermatitis yet, but the cost, especially in these high-cost biologic categories of the infusion, pales in comparison to the cost of the drug itself. So that's usually a de minimis cost and not included in our formulary decision-making process. And finally, quality of life. A real challenge, while there have been metrics for quality of life assessment around for years in the atopic dermatitis space, there are more than 25 different outcome measures that can be used, and uh, there is not a routine one used. So incorporating quality of life or patient-reported outcomes is a real challenge. With the advent of ICER, the Institute for Clinical Effectiveness Review, there has been much more intense interest in how we use cost-effectiveness analysis in the 
uh, formulary inclusion and positioning uh, debate. While health economic outcomes research has been around for decades, the primary limitation to those analyses has been the concern about bias in those reports. So having an independent agency like ICER really increases our confidence and our willingness to use that type of data. Having said that, while atopic dermatitis is the most common form of inflammatory skin disease, it's very difficult to show that therapies are cost effective uh, and certainly cost savings because they cause very little morbidity, at least in the sense of consumption of healthcare resources. So this is a space where uh, while we can uh, do cost effectiveness analyses, to my knowledge, there have been no recent ones done, including by ICER, and even were they to be done, it's likely to show that they're very costly, again, because we don't save lives. We can't calculate a cost per life you're saved. The, the savings is primarily through improving quality of life, and given the cost of these therapies, the cost per quality adjusted life year is expected to be very high. A key concern, regardless of your perspective as a patient, payer, employer, is the high cost of drug therapies. Employers are concerned about the high cost because of the impact on premiums. Patients are concerned about the financial toxicity of these drugs and what the impact is on the overall compliance with these therapies and therefore the overall response to disease. With high deductible health plans, which might have four to $6,000 out of pocket uh, maximums for families, there can be a significant barrier because of the cost associated with these high deductible plans. More recently, a number of plans have uh, said that they won't cover the copay assistance uh, provided by a manufacturer, copay assistance foundations, or alternatively, they'll accept the copay assistance but that amount won't apply to the deductible. So for example, if a, a drug has a $500 copay assistance program, that will be accepted by the specialty pharmacy to cover the patient's cost sharing, but that $500 won't apply to the patient's out-of-pocket maximum. In patients with atopic dermatitis is their only comorbidity. Uh, that may not be an issue because they may have very few other expenses other than office visit copays. But for patients who have the allergic triad with atopic dermatitis, uh, asthma, and seasonal allergies, they may have considerable cost sharing, especially if they have asthma. So there is clear evidence that the financial toxicity associated with these therapies does uh, worsen adherence and worsen outcomes, and yet there is not a good, good solution for that to date which again begs the question of how long do patients need to be on these therapies and if there's any evidence to support weaning the therapy once the patient's under control. From the health plan perspective, and probably more importantly from the physician's perspective, there are still a number of barriers even with modern biologic treatment for atopic dermatitis. In the clinical trials that were done with dupilumab, for example, there was a 36% improvement rate compared to less than 10% in the placebo. So 64% of patients didn't hit the minimum threshold of response. Even for those who did, however, that did not remove the need to continue other therapies such as emoluents and other regimens to help improve their atopic dermatitis. So it's still the case that patients need to have a multimodal approach to the treatment of their atopic dermatitis. As we referenced earlier, there are challenges with compliances to those programs. So the development of, of treatment plans and treatment action plans like we have in asthma is still pertinent. The evidence supporting the use of those treatment plans is weak at best. There's no evidence of harm. But again, the point is that while we'd like to have a pill or an injection that obviates the need for these more complex treatment regimens, there is still a need for those complex treatment regimens and systems of care that support that. So probably the biggest gap is simply the fact that we don't have good systems of care in place to help support patients whose treatment needs are complex and difficult to adhere to. From a practical perspective, one way of overcoming these, these gaps or barriers is to have uh, comprehensive care management programs. If you look historically at what was done in the multiple sclerosis space, manufacturers developed care management programs and telephone assistance programs to help ensure that patients tolerated the side effects of therapies and maintain compliance. And that may be a good model for atopic dermatitis. Clearly, there's a need for physician involvement 
still, but this is an example where ensuring patient and parent compliance with medications as well as other pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies could be done telephonically, likely with good effect. One of the key challenges in providing patient support for those patients who have complex chronic illness is how do we coordinate the coordinators? We can have care managers, uh, physicians, and others engaged in the, the patient's treatment and in the support of that patient's treatment. That can include care managers in the provider's office, care managers from the health plan support or care management from the manufacturer, but really coordinating all those people is critical so that the patient has one point of contact and what we've done as a health plan and working with provider groups, especially around cancer care, is to delineate who is responsible for what activities. So, for example, the health plan coordinates the calls regarding patient benefits and cost sharings, uh, including things like clinical trials and hospice and second opinion programs, and the practice care manager coordinates the rest of activities, including hospital follow-ups, coordination of visits with other specialists, radiation oncology, surgery, et cetera. Uh, and I think that's a, a good model to ensure that patients aren't inundated with phone calls and to make sure that they know who is best suited to help them for a specific question. Could that be done in atopic dermatitis? It certainly could. The question is who's going to fund those types of activities, especially since there are not significant costs to be avoided from providing those services. If you look at cancer, avoiding a hospital readmission can have a significant savings, which could in turn fund care management activities. Whereas in atopic dermatitis, there aren't a lot of costs to be offset. So while care management could be a very effective tool in helping patients optimize their care with or without biologic agents, there has to be a clear agreement on who can fund those activities and what their responsibilities are going to be. If you look back into the 1990s for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, when Enbrel was first brought onto the market, it was hailed as a, as a game changer, and it certainly was. It took rheumatoid arthritis as a chronic progressive debilitating disease to one that could be treated. But now we have uh, dozens of drugs that can be used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. We're kind of where we were in the 1990s with rheumatoid arthritis today with atopic dermatitis. We have a single drug that's been approved, but there are many others in the pipeline that will likely be approved in the next one to four years. So we'll have a richness of opportunities, but it also creates challenges in understanding what optimal care is. As payers, providers, patients, employers all want to understand what optimal care is, we'll have lots of options without clearly having evidence about what optimal care is. Uh, so that's one of the, the challenges on the horizon. It's a good challenge to have more options than information, but as payers, we're certainly interested in funding those therapies that are most effective, and yet in the absence of that, it's likely to come down to what's at least costly agent, at least to start with. I think there's also a real opportunity, as we've talked about previously, for introducing care management in the space to make sure that patients are compliant not only with their medications, but also the non-pharmacologic regimens to help improve their condition. So far, we don't have high cure rates, and we'll see if with new agents we get higher response rates than we have today. Certainly, there's a role for pharmacy, I believe, in this condition to make sure that we do complete medication reviews, especially for those patients who have the allergic triad with allergic rhinitis and asthma as well. So. The good news is that in what might be considered an orphan disease simply because we had no modern therapies, we're going to have many of those in the future. But a tenant with uh, those new options and new opportunities is going to be the need to find the most cost-effective alternatives for the management of this to do our best possible to make sure patients have access to effective therapies, but in a way that keeps it affordable for patients and payers alike.